Ask the first question, or you want to ask the first question? Okay. The title so far this is um, Real Change and First Focus Group on the 24th of October 2018. So, the first question is In what way do whites or, and or non vendors experience real changes, programs, services, and practices as normal and accommodating? Well, that's doing it that way is humongous so we want to do one at a time yeah okay so in what ways do <laughs> sorry no that's good no in what ways do whites experience real changes programs services and practices as normal and accommodating uh so we've recently gone through a hiring process a few times um that i've been involved with in different levels and one thing is I think that the way that we list salary or do not list salary or say dependent on experience um, and leave room for negotiations I think can be a barrier to a lot of people um, and the way that we request a background check for mm -hmm. our candidates I think is antithetical to Real Change's stated mm -hmm. mission, um, as well as other documentation and paperwork that's required during that process. I know that there are some things that we are required to do for our insurance. Um, however, I think that if we want to be on the cutting edge, then we can look into the, the risks and rewards of that. And so would you say that these things, these practices right now are normal and accommodating for whites? I, yeah, I think more so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would also say um, with hiring practices that I've been a part of too recently, um, when it's clear that they, we have a candidate of color that is absolutely skilled and ready to take on the position, if they at all indicate that they are really interested in racial justice, um, that is sometimes looked at by um, management as someone that might come into the organization with their own agenda that might take real change away from what we're doing. And I think, I didn't even think about hiring practices, but since Camilla brought that up, I wanted to flag that. Um, you know, when I, I'm thinking of me as a, as a white staff person, when I applied for the job, you know, I very openly in my interview process said that I'm a socialist. There wasn't a concern that I'm going to come in with a socialist agenda and like upend real change, but when there are staff or potential staff of color um, and they express that interest, there's a concern um, that they will come in with that, an agenda that will... Um, derail or uh, take away from the job description and um, that's problematic and I think just our our hiring process could be more formal and professional um, I've been in hiring processes where people are giving grades out and uh, that's not super professional or legit or like person first it's not, yeah, it feels, I don't know. Also, our interview panels are predominantly white staff that are interviewing. We, we, I thought it was always traditional to always have a vendor on the hiring committee. Um, I might have been wrong about that, but there are a couple hires recently that didn't have a vendor, um, and I think it's essential for us to have a vendor on, on the hiring committee. There wasn't a vendor on mine. We just had Shelly and Ashley. Anyone else on that question? Anything else? Can you repeat? So that it was, in what ways do white experience real changes programs, services, and practices as normal and accommodating?
Well, like Lucy said too, when you come in as a vendor, all white, unless we have a volunteer that's a color which we don't have a majority of volunteers at the desk of color. Um, we don't have a large, like, I would say the next language that we have uh, that vendors speak the most is Spanish, but it's small. But could we, like, sh should we do an analysis of what other languages vendors or vendors speak that are that come in often and could we tailor the vendor center in that way to be inclusive and accommodating um you know we have signs up i think they're still up there was a time that they were down um during uh upgrading but that were like you know immigrants welcome here refugees welcome here uh, black lives matter like those are all really great there's other things that we could do to make sure that's a, a space that non-whites feel super comfortable in. Those are back up. Great. Yeah. Do we ever, sorry. I was just gonna ask, do we ever have to like turn people away because we don't have like someone who can speak no. Spanish or a different language? Or do for the most part, do people who come in here, um, or vendors who come in here, are they able to? In my experience, in the two months that I've been here, we haven't had an issue with language. We had Alexis, who was here for a while, who would speak Spanish, but we haven't had a vendor come in that hasn't been able to speak some English. Okay. We also now have the translated materials, so I should maybe make sure that all vendor center staff are aware of that. So we have translated materials, um, policies, and orientation, and we also have a board member who has generously volunteered to allow us to call her oh. if someone needs translation on the spot. Sweet. Um, I also can, I mean, I'm not fluent in Spanish by any means, yeah. but like, I go, I've been to Mexico a lot, my family's in Mexico, and I can get around by myself, so if I like speak slowly and ask them <laughs> to speak slowly, I'm sure we could figure something out. <laughs> so just for if, if you guys Thank ever you. need anything. Yeah, I had to fill out a ballot in Spanish today. Yeah, that's challenging. Uh -huh. Yeah, Good job, Georgia. <laughs> I can speak broken Spanish, but that's about it. Yeah, it's it's hard to fill out a ballot in your own language. So, so how about in what ways do non-vendors experience real changes, programs, services, and practices as normal and accommodating? Can you read it again? I'm so sorry, Christina. In what ways did non-vendors? I, when I read that, mm -hmm. at first I assumed staff. Okay. Right? But I heard you say there's more than that. Mm -hmm. Right? Volunteers, community, and prospective vendors. So, mm -hmm. originally it was intended as staff, right? Mm -hmm. In what ways do staff experience real change, program services, and practices as normal and accommodating or non-vendors? And that one descriptive word really does change it up. Mm -hmm. The entrance, maybe. The way, just, I mean, mm -hmm. this is a controversial subject and there's not much we can do about it, but um, it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. but the first avenue entrance is not, ex not for vendors other than mm -hmm. folks who uh, need like wheelchair access mm -hmm. um, and just like this this thing from the building that says vent it's it's essentially just not wanting people who look homeless in the hallways of our building mm -hmm. I mean well, that's that's like how we can't keep this door mm -hmm. open yeah because they don't want people seeing what's mm -hmm. in our office mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or like the bathrooms too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That there's the nice bathrooms back here, and then there's the ones for vendors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the bathrooms that are locked. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I will say though that um, I mean I think that's definitely problematic. But I was very surprised that you guys just allowed, or we allowed, um, everyone to just come in and out of the downstairs back room. I mean, because we have money back there, we have offices and. 
everywhere else I've worked, like at KCLS, like it's strictly only employees. Mm. So I thought that it was really welcoming to have it be open and it's just kind of like, it's it kind of reminds me of like a community center in which anyone can come and go and just hang out and it's, it's just an, it's a, it's a welcoming place mm. downstairs. So I was, I was surprised by that. Um, so that was good. I'm happy about that. Um, but I do feel like there's like these separate levels um, where the vendors, they, they never come upstairs. I rarely interact with vendors unless I come downstairs to come talk to you guys. Um, so, I, like, interaction between the people who are working on the computers and um, who are on that second level with the vendors would be nice on a more regular basis. I always think that we can do a better job appreciating our volunteers. Mm. I just, I always think that, like, as a staff, not all staff have worked with volunteers at the same level. Um, sometimes I get a feeling of taking volunteers for granted from specific staff, and I just, as far as that question, just really want to highlight, like, especially the volunteers that are at the sales desk, like, mm -hmm. They are there on their own volition, one of the hardest volunteer jobs, and they do it outstanding. And just if, um, like with the badge, the badge policy, like there are many times I've overheard like um, a manager in an unfriendly tone, in my opinion, like, did you ask for the badge? Did you ask, did you check the badge? Are they a vendor? Are they a vendor? And um, that volunteer has been there years all at most of them at the sales desk have been there years like they they know what they're doing so just like how do we as staff interact with our volunteers to make them feel welcome because we would not we would not function as an organization without volunteers mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think for the most part they feel welcome but I I'm just always as someone who's worked with volunteers a lot keenly aware of making sure that they always feel welcome and not just taken for granted. Sorry, did you? No, no I was just going to say, they're, they're, I mean, most people too is it, are there weekly. Like we have someone who's there the same hours every week. Mm -hmm. Like it's a job mm -hmm. almost, which mm -hmm. is incredible. Yeah. And in what ways do people of color experience real change as accommodating and or dismissive of their identities and social contexts? I've had, um, like, at the sales desk, um, we ha sometimes have random items that people donate that we have available if vendors ask, and um, there are some needs from people of color that I feel we don't have as many resources as, like, for instance, someone asked for a hair pick because mm. I know that there had been a hairbrush before because another vendor said so, we didn't have that, um, mm. which sends, like, a very clear message. Is this also, is this just, what's the overall premise? Is it reflecting first to the mission or is it just things that we think could go better? It's just so open-ended, I'm uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's both and. It's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's both and. It's about uh, really just getting to assessment of the organization where we are and how we become better, okay. right? And if this is the target, our mission, how closely are we aligned to the mission and what mission? And it's the hardest, the challenge about this work is about how do you just be transparent about it? Like, and so, oh, yeah. so just be as raw and honest <laughs> as you can possibly can so we can have a really good accurate assessment of where we are. Right. We used to have a mission statement here, so that's what I was looking for, because I would really like to uh, reflect on it right now. Yeah. To provide opportunity and a voice for low-income and homeless people speak. while taking action for yeah. economic, social, Very. and racial justice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Camilla. Um, that's a powerful <laughs> statement. This is just an, an interaction with the vendor that I had yesterday that is still um, weighing on me heavily. Um, you know, we are here for vendors, 
We want them to be successful. Um, we want to increase circulation. We want to get bring in more vendors. Like, er, basically, a lot of the focus is on that aspect because without the vendors, we don't have an organization. Based on this conversation that I had yesterday, um, like what opportunities are we missing for that cohesiveness with vendors of color that have been uprooted from their community, that don't know what, who, who their community is, come here for personal relationships. We do not, we cannot offer um, the personal relationships that some vendors want. That sets up a very nasty but real power dynamic. We as an organization don't know how to navigate that. We don't know how to address it. Um, a lot of us are keenly aware of that, but we need to have a conversation on it. Um, that does not mean, by any means, let me just emphasize, overemphasize that, that we need to have a strict uh, guidebook for how you have relationships with vendors. That's absolutely not it. But when you have a vendor that is really wicked smart and they know that there is a power differential and you're not going to share those personal details of your life with them, I don't know what you say at that stage. Because um, we do want to build authentic relationships. But that is not, I don't know if I'm being clear. We want to build authentic relationships. We are not a direct service provider in the traditional sense where you do just see folks come in in a transactional way. We build relationships, we care about our vendors, but there are some limits that we push up against and we're failing at those, like this vendor experience in particular. Could we do more to offer a community here that is not staff-centered? Excuse me, that would um, provide vendors that don't have that outside um, as a basis for them to be more stable in a sense. Um, it's not just, you know, it's about selling the paper and increasing circulation, but there's like a, a foundation that needs to be laid for vendors to be successful. And if we're not helping to provide that in the boundaries that we can, we're really not setting up for success. Um, and could we offer like vendors of color like a support a support group to connect with each other that maybe we could even draw uh, recommendations out of for how to make real change everything that you've just asked in that question because I mean, we have lots of opinions, but we don't always necessarily ask the population. And if the title is Homeless Empowerment yeah. Project, mm -hmm. where is the empowerment? If yeah. Not? But I also think that we're running up against, we're running up against a, a problem, which is that there are a core set of vendors who are deeply engaged in the organization, and it's a shrinking number. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I don't know, 20, maybe less than that, who are here on a weekly basis, engaged in committees, doing, you know, being representatives of, of their peer group, and, um, and those folks, and that the reason that that group is, I think, so small has to do with, like, lack of opportunity to enter, but also like barrier to entry, which is time and, I don't know. It, it, we ask a lot of people um, in order to be a member of a committee or mm -hmm. the vendor advisory board, and mm -hmm. it's a high bar. Well, especially because a lot of our vendors are just struggling to get their basic needs fit filled you know mm -hmm. so like they're struggling to find shelter they're thinking about what am I where am I gonna stay tonight they're thinking about am I gonna have enough food so I mean it's Maslow's hierarchy mm -hmm. when you're just focused on getting your basic survival needs needs met you, you don't have the time to be to give to volunteering 
or to come here and talk about are we getting accurate representation are we getting um how are the newspapers selling or, you know mm -hmm. it's um i think that's something that we take for granted a lot is the fact that we are so comfortable in our lives that i can think about i'm stressed about next week the fact that i can think ahead and not mm -hmm. be so focused on right now and just am i going to am I going to be able to make it through tonight? Um, so. Mm -hmm. there's, an, there's another thing about the vendor experience that I just, I worry about a little bit, which is um, like really clear, clear understandings of the disciplinary process and pathways back into the organization if you've been terminated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I sometimes think that we don't communicate those as well as we could um, without, you know, harping to vendors in good standing all the time about like, this is how you can get kicked out and this is what the process back in is. But I do think like when someone has been terminated, following up with them, having some, having some kind of process in place where where appropriate, letting them know that we want them back. Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. I know that's comp. I know that can be really complicated. <laughs> yeah. Well, that'd be a traumatic experience, you know, if we just shut shut them out, especially if they're super involved. So I think it's important, for sure, and to make sure that they understand why they're being terminated so that they can avoid it in the future because ultimately we want them to be here you know but we have to set boundaries but we want to make sure that they we help them with being successful here mm. and I think that goes to another um, layer of when we communicate like a lot of us we have degrees we've gone to college so we have to communicate we, we might use more um, different words but we have to make sure that they understand what we're saying and not using this very complex vocabulary not saying that they're not smart but they just might not have as much of education because they didn't have the opportunity to not because they're yeah or because of a language barrier too which also and I know I talked to Christina a lot on this prepping for the staff retreat which is why I, I mean, trauma-informed care, having that lens, the training that we need as staff to do these disciplinary measures and to have those conversations. Like, I don't have a social work degree. I don't have the background in psychology or any of those sorts of things. Um, and when it comes to needing to have hard conversations, but you need to have them because you want to have clear expectations and set boundaries and not set folks up for failure. Sometimes I feel effective, sometimes I don't feel effective. Yeah, some of that is my own just, you know, self-critique, but I feel like it's essential for staff at this organization when we are such a different model, like Ainsley said, an empowerment model. Like we have to provide staff the training for de-escalation. We still haven't done that with our new staff and it makes me really upset. Um, we have to provide those tools. You don't learn it overnight, but you have to provide it. Um, and a chance for staff to talk about, um, to bounce ideas off of each other when it comes to vendors and discipline, and sometimes you need to remove them from, from things, you know? Like, I don't know if you still do this in vendor program, but something I really liked that was there before under Jared was like the first 30, 20, 30 minutes of the staff meeting, it was okay, vent. It was a vent, get it off your chest, and then you moved in. And it's not a gossip session, and it wasn't meant as like putting down of anything, but it was realizing that staff are in a very, these are difficult jobs. We're not well equipped always to work with the population in a way that we're not doing harm. No one sets out to do harm, but we could be doing harm and I just, I think if we're going to be looking at this holistically, we have to provide like basic trainings to staff, like on a quarterly basis. Um, 
and have places for feedback when difficult things do come up so that our vendors, as they come in, especially vendors of color, that we are meeting them where they are at, communicating on their level, and making this an enjoyable and a welcoming experience as much as possible. Yeah, that. let's get to the um, second question because yep. it's a question around accountability. Mm -hmm. And so, in real change organizational documents, so think about the documents to, um, for real change, are vendors absent from the named stakeholders? And how does this contribute to the lack of accountability to vendors? I don't really understand yeah. the question, honestly. Okay. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> yeah, think about, if you think about all of your documents that you have in real change, right, whether it's all of your identity documents from your website to your any kind of strategic plan or like your mission and your vision, like do you see vendors, do you see vendors in those documents? Right. Okay. How prevalent are they in all of the documents? Mm -hmm. okay. Named in the document as a stakeholder. Yeah. So named in the document mm -hmm. as, uh, mm -hmm. as someone who's impacted by mm -hmm. whatever the activity is and or someone who would be included in the right. decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you going to have these focus groups with vendors? Mm 